Chapter 3. The Magic Ore in the Mystic Supper About an hour later, Roy arrived at the store, very tired, very hungry, and tremendously excited after his afternoon's experience. As a good detective, however, he felt it wiser to say nothing as yet about the figure he was sure he had seen at the mouth of the cave. After supper, fortified by some good scotch oat cakes and rich creamy milk, Roy thought he would spend the evening trying to find Oscar and Bruce in the hope of getting some information from them. He had not seen them as yet, but from what he had heard about them, he felt sure they would all have a good time together. He had some distance to walk out of the village, but striding along swiftly, he soon came upon the gamekeeper's cottage. It was an attractive home with two stories and a tilted roof, quite different from the thatched roof bungalows in the village. The two brothers were at home. Roy saw them while still a good way off and was able to get quite near to them before being noticed. Being rural, being real boys, they were enjoying themselves throwing stones at a glass bottle, which they had stood up on the granite wall that surrounded the garden. Hearing footsteps, they turned sharply around and greeted the newcomer with a cheery hello. Roy introduced himself as the storekeeper's nephew from Liverpool, and this was sufficient to make the other two very interested in him. Some general questions and answers followed. Then all three took up the stone throwing till a final shot by Roy made sure that the glass bottle would never hold water or anything else again. I take you in the house, said Oscar, but since father and mother left, it's been getting into rather a pickle. We're going to have a proper cleanup the day before they return, added Bruce with a broad grin. Do you sleep here all by yourselves? asked Roy. We sleep like tops, replied Oscar. Don't you feel a bit afraid? asked Roy. Why, no. We've lived here all our lives, and we know everybody around for miles, said Oscar, as though he were as old as Peter MacDonald's. Do you think there might be smugglers or spies in the cave? suggested Roy. Bosh! Have you heard old Peter's story already? Why, several of us searched the cave from end to end, and what did we find? Nothing. Roy pricked up his ears. Were you with the search party? Surely. We wouldn't have missed the fun for anything. Naturally, it was a bit spooky, but then that made it worthwhile. And they didn't find anything? Not a trace. And didn't we all laugh at poor old Peter? The conversation turned to the other mysterious happenings. But while Oscar and Bruce seemed to be desperately anxious to find out who was behind them all, they could offer no suggestion as to how this might be done. Presently, the subject was dropped, and Oscar asked Roy, whether he would like to go fishing the following morning. Nothing could have pleased him better, and this, uh, this agreed upon, he returned to his uncle's home. The following morning, the three spent a most enjoyable time fishing in the waters of the bay. Oscar and Bruce, being experts, soon left poor Roy far behind in number of fish caught. Whatever you're going to do with all these fish, asked Roy wonderingly as they landed. Oh, sell them, responded Oscar. There are always people who want them, and there are never enough, added Bruce. You must make quite a little pile of this game, laughed Roy. We do. It swells our pocket money. But what are you going to do tomorrow? Would you like to go fishing with us again, asked Oscar. I'd like to, but I'm afraid I can't, replied Roy. My dad has planned two or three trips for the next 
few days, and he wants me to go with him. But after that, all right, when you're free, said the others, and so the matter was left. The boat being hauled up on the beach, the boys parted. Roy, going back to the store, the proud possessor of a number of fish, which he soon presented in triumph to his father. But the thought of the fish quickly faded into oblivion before a new and gripping interest. Heard the news? asked his uncle. As soon as Roy's first catch had received due comment. No, anything exciting? You remember that old Sandy lost a brand new oar in that last storm, about the same time the cork jacket was lost? I heard something about it, said Roy. Well, last night... He's not sure of the hour, but he felt a big thud on his chest. Looking up, what should he see but the lost oar stuck through the window of his cottage, with the blade on the sill and the butt on his chest. He thought he must be dreaming, but sure enough, when he knew he was awake, he found that it was real, a real solid oar, the very one he had lost, with his name carved on it. The strange thing is, no one knows anything about it. I never saw anyone happier than old Sandy is today. But it's rather uncanny, isn't it? Roy thought it was. He thought more than that. Indeed, his thoughts kept him awake a good part of the night but he was still unable to solve the mystery. The following day, he and his father and uncle took a long trip over the mountains, climbing one of the highest peaks to get the view. It was glorious being up so high, looking around at the world beneath. In one direction were mountains, 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 as far as the eye could reach, towering one behind another, till all were lost in mist. In the opposite direction was the broad expanse of the Atlantic, for once comparatively restful, spreading away to the distant, indistinct horizon. Except for the long tramp, the hard climb, and the magnificent views, the day was uneventful. But not so the evening. Returning to Longview Village, By a slightly different route, they chanced to pass the ancient shepherd's cottage that old Peter MacDonald called his home. It was a typical highland dwelling, one story, granite walls, thatched roof, with two rooms and an open fireplace. Sad to say, there was nobody to clean it up now, for his wife had died many years ago. It was very late when the three travelers passed by the cottage, all weary, footsore, and hungry. Indeed, it must have been nearly midnight, but there was a light shining from under old Peter's door, and as the sound of passing footsteps was heard inside, the door flew open, and old Peter stood on the threshold. "'Who's that?' he called. "'Wallace,' was the reply." Come here for a minute, cried the old man excitedly. Come in here, do. His voice sounded husky. And Roy, as he entered, thought he saw marks of tears on the old man's bearded face. What is it? asked the storekeeper. Just this. I never saw the likes of it. No one ever did it before. Not for all the long, long years since Mary died. Folks have been very kind, but let me tell you, when I came in this evening all tired and weary after a long, trying day, expecting to find just the place I'd left in the morning, what should I see but everything all different? Someone had had a regular cleanup, which I'd meant to do many a time, and never could somehow seem to get around to it. And there was the best 
fire I've ever seen a blazing in the grat in the grate, and on the table, why, Mr. Wallace, I've I never saw such a spread. And don't you know who did it? No, sir. That's what I can't make out. Who could have done it? And what's more, who would have done it? There was no time for discussion. In any way, the travelers were too tired for it. So, bidding old Peter good night, they left him in his happiness to speculate as he wished and hastened home. But Roy, weary as he was, was not too tired to think. Was this another link in the chain of mysteries? Oh, why hadn't he thought to ask old Peter what he had for supper? He thought he recognized the odor in the room. But what of that? What possible connection could Peter MacDonald's supper have with the cork jacket, the oar, the horse, or the noise, the noises in the cave? Roy puzzled in vain as he plodded, plodded on, his brain soon vying with his weary legs as to which would give way first.